Good morning. I'd like to welcome you to another one of our small group Bible studies. We're glad to have you today. Today we're going to start a new series that's looked at putting fear in its place. Fear is something that seems to grip all of us from time to time and various people in various ways. But we can look at it through the next few weeks about what God says about fear. Let's go to the Lord in prayer first. Fathers, we look at your word today and we look at the word fear and what it means. Lord, help us to uh, realize that if we'll believe in you, we'll put all of our trust in you. Lord, there's nothing for us to truly fear about because you're the one that's totally in control. And Lord, if, we, if there's somebody out there this morning who doesn't know who you are as their personal Savior, don't know exactly what you've done for them on the cross, Lord, I pray that listening today that they'll come to realization of that. And Lord, for the people who are hearing it today who uh, just stand in fear all the time, and sometimes that's us as Christians, Lord, because we don't know how to place it. Help us to realize, Lord, you're the answer to, to that too. So as we look at your word today, may you be honored and glorified through it. And may people see and may we see as Christians how to draw closer to you and let you take care of the things in our life. In Christ's name I pray, amen. You know, today we live in really uncertain times as we all know, and and uh, whether it's in the, the local pandemic or the national pandemic that's been going on or a worldwide pandemic for all these, for the last couple of years, where the not it's racial tension, uh, political divisions, which are out there, uh, the economy, and a lot of people are worried about what's going on there. And then, of course, health issues that we all have from time to time. And violence has never been as bad on the face of the earth that, I, that, that we know of as as it uh, it is right now, and the concerns for our families and friends. And of course, the uncertainty of how life can turn out can also bring some uneasy fears. But the thing about it, the Bible tells us that God is the one who is in total control if we would just uh, turn it over to Him and and let Him take care of it. That would take away a lot of these fears. But He's a sovereign, all-powerful God who makes everything and allows everything to be as it is. And so real fear truly is not knowing who God is or as pe- or people who uh, are Christians by letting fear take over their life rather than putting it in God's hands. That's, that's that type of fear. But we're also going to uh, see that God talks to us about the Bible and tells us that He's the one that's in control. And when He's the one that's in control and He's the sovereign, all-powerful God, if we'll just turn it over to Him and let Him take care of it, then he's the one that's going to take care of that fear. And, and when we do that, then we can have the, what's called reverential fear. We're going to look at both those fears today. And that's turning it over to God and fearing God, not from the standpoint that we're sitting there trembling or we're, we're really anxious about what's going on, but in awe and, and praise to him. That's the, kind, that's the kind of fear we need from God. And so when, when we look at ourselves today in, in, in that light as Christians today, we have really no reason why we should fear because God is the one who's going to take care of everything. So if you will, take and turn in your Bibles today to Psalms, the 33rd chapter. Psalms, the 33rd chapter. And we're going to look at the sovereignty of the Lord in the creation and in history. Chapter 33 and verse 1. It says, Rejoice in the Lord, O you righteous, for praise from the upright is beautiful. That's one thing that God loves is our praise. And he deserves it because he's the one who spoke everything into existence. We're going to look at that in a minute. But he's the one who's in total control. And when we know him and we know that he loves us and we know that we serve him, then we have no reason to fear him because it'd be like fearing our dads or moms who truly love us, who truly love us and take care of us. We don't have to fear him. We're in awe and respect of them for who they are. But we don't have to fear them like, uh, like we fear some other things. So he says, Rejoice in the Lord, O you righteous, for praise from the upright is beautiful. God loves our praise. He loves for us to honor and give him glory in everything that we do. It says, verse 2, Praise praise the Lord with a harp. Make melody to him with an instrument of ten strings. Sing to him a new song. Play skillfully and with a shout of joy. You see, the Lord loves music. He really does. And he, he loves for us to honor him and, and worship him and singing songs to it. And he loves to hear our voice lift up and praise him. And verse 4 says, For the word of the Lord is right, and all his work is done in truth. And he loves the righteousness and justice, and the earth is full of the goodness of the Lord. The earth is full of good things. 
And God wants to bless us with, with, with all of those things. But we've got to learn that we need to turn our lives over to Him and let Him have control of them. If when we do that, then we can get to the point in our life where the, the fear that we have is nothing but a love, a true love and awe of who God is. Verse 6 says, By the word of the Lord the heavens were made, and all the host of them by the breath of His mouth. That's amazing. Uh, Genesis goes into deep detail about the how the earth was created, how God spoke it all into existence. But he spoke it just, it, 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 he didn't have to build nothing. He didn't have to have a crew come out and build it and anything. God spoke it. That's the kind of God he is. And he's the God that we serve. He's the God that we should serve. And when we serve that kind of a God, he loves us very much. And he says, that the word of the Lord spoke the heavens into existence. And you know, they there say that there's three heavens out there. One heaven is from right on the surface of the earth up to, up to uh, where our atmosphere and everything ends. Then you've got all of space from that time on up where all the stars and the planets are. We're going to talk about them a little bit more in, in detail a little bit. But then above that, above where we can see, the last star that we can see, that's where God's abode is and that's, that's where His heaven is, the third heaven it's called. But by the word of the Lord, the heavens were made and, by, and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth, it's amazing that he just spoke it into existence. We, well, you know, it's it's hard to even fathom that. It takes it takes so much for us to do and and build anything in in our own lives and and all the construction that we've seen over all the years and the beautiful things that's been built. But it takes time. But God just spoke it into existence. That's all He had to do. So it says, by the word of the Lord, the heavens were made, and all the host of them by the breath of His mouth. Everything that there is. God spoke it into existence. It says that he gathers the waters of the sea together as a heap and he lays up the deep in storehouses. It's amazing how the oceans work and how the water's on the face of the earth and how God laid it out and everything. He knew exactly what he was doing. And that all, all the oceans and everything that's made out there, God, God just spoke them into existence. And during the during Noah's flood, remember when it the earth completely was flooded with with water from rain, it all dissipated and all disappeared, and and the lakes were still there and the oceans were still there, just like they were before it ever happened. And that's because God's the one who's in control and He's the one who spoke it. So then in verse eight, it talks about let all the earth fear the Lord. Now, this is the reverential fear we was looking at a while ago. It's not a fear where we walking around just mumbling all the time and shaking because we're scared of what God's going to do. That's not the kind of fear we need to do. But we need to, we need to realize who he is and what he did because he spoke the world into existence, because he can do those things. We need to be in awe of him. And we need to realize that he is the true creator and we're just humans. God created us. He brought us down and he made us out of one man. He made, made man and woman, the very first man and woman, Adam and Eve. And so because of that, God's the one who created them. And it says all the heavens were made by him. He gathers the waters. Excuse me, verse 8 says, let us, all, let, us all, let all the earth fear the Lord and let all the habits of the world stand in awe of him. That's that fear because of who he is. And we need to stand in fear because none of us can even come close to who God is and what he did for us. And the thing about it is he, he made us for, for, for himself. He made us so that we could have a relationship with him. God, God wasn't one kind of the gods that made everything and just sat back and said, okay, that's all. I'm, let's, go, uh, something, let's go around and play some ping pong or something. That, that wasn't what he done. Matter of fact, if you read uh, Genesis in, in the first, second, third chapter, you'll see that after God made everything and formed man and, and made woman and took woman out of his body and made woman, he came down and walked and talked with them. God wanted a relationship with them. He desired that. And we don't know how long he was on the face of the earth walking and talking to Adam and Eve before the sin caused the separation between them. It doesn't tell us how long it was. We have no idea. Maybe it was three days. Maybe it was three million years. We don't have any idea. But he walked and talked with them. He spoke everything into existence and that he wanted a relationship with man and he still wants that relationship today. So it says, let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. We should stand in awe of him. It's amazing to me how many people today that we look up to and and just uh, just just make all kind of deal out of who they are and everything. 
Some of them because they're millionaires. Some of them because they're movie stars or, or country music stars or whatever. Or great football players or whatever. And all those things are good. There's nothing wrong with that. But we put them on a pedestal because of who they are and, and what they do. And the one we should really be in awe of is the one who spoke the world into existence. It's amazing to me how man is sometimes. But it says here that we should stand in awe of him and realize that he is the true and living God. Verse 9 says, For he spoke and it was done, and he commanded and it stood fast. Just think, we don't know how long ago it was that he made this earth, but it's still here. We don't know how long ago he made, he made all the heavens. We're going to look at them in just a second. We don't know how long ago that it was that he made them, but they're all still there, and they're all still working just exactly like he made them. So then in verse 10, it says that the Lord brings the counsel of the nations to nothing. That's amazing. You know, he's the ones in control. We all think that we are. And all the world nations that go along and everything and, and, and think about all the nations that have come and gone. I mean, when's the last time you talked to a Roman citizen? Or when was the last time that uh, you, you talked to somebody who was from a, a foreign country that used to be and it, it's not, not even existent anymore? How long has it been since you talked to anybody like that? You see, all those things are gone. They come and they go and they're gone. And God's the one who's in control. And he's the one who's going, the one, one nation that he made, he's going to, and we weren't even formed. The United States wasn't even formed when he talked to the children of Israel about going over into the promised land. Our nation wasn't even formed during that period of time. But now Israel is still a country today. It's still a little bitty nation today. But you know what? It's a nation that God has blessed and it's a nation that God will continue to bless. So it says he brings to counsel the nation of nothing. You know, we have the United Nations. We have various uh, leaders from all the nations in the world. They all get together and they're going to make laws and everything about what's going to happen. And guess what? None of it's for anything when it's all said and done. Because, you know, God's the one's in control. And he brings, they, they get together and they decide they're going to do this and they decide they're going to do that. A lot of times you just get together and argue, just like we do at, at some of our county and, and uh, city meetings sometimes. You know, we, we, everybody wants their own opinion. Everybody wants what wants to be done, done in their way and the way that they want it. But it says that God brings those kind of counsels to nothing. And like I say, you know, for the, for the, the Roman Empire, one of the greatest empires that ever was in history, it's not, it's non existent anymore. When it was such a it, it ruled the world the known world at that time. So he says it brings those of the nations together. Then look what he says at the rest of verse 10. He makes the plans of the people of no effect. You know what? He says that our ideas that we got sometimes they don't amount to anything. And some of the things that we do, you know, if if we just had a if we just had a, a, a different president. If we just had a Republican in there, if we just had a Democrat in there, or if we just had somebody else in there, if we just had this person in there, we need somebody like this, we need somebody like that. And God says the things you're planning is of no effect because I'm the one's in control. I'm the one who's in charge. You can plan and do anything you want, but when it's all said and done, God says that there, the, the plans that we have or no effect. That's the reason why he tells us in the scripture, you plan and you go and you do things and, and you say, we're going to do this and we're going to do that and everything. And he says, you don't know, you don't even know what's going to happen tomorrow. And none of us do. We have no idea. We may have a heart attack and die tonight and might, may not even be alive tomorrow. But God says, we make all these plans, but they don't affect him at all. Because he's got his plan that he has, and he's the one who spoke the world into existence, and he's the one who, who can do the things that he wants to do. So our ideas that we have sometime, and God's not saying we don't make some good ideas and have some good things once in a while to do, especially when it comes to being good to people and doing things. All those things God loves. But when it's all said and done, God's the one who, who has the only idea that's really going to matter one way or the other. So it says, the counsel of the Lord stands forever and the plans of his heart to all generations. Blessed is, is the nation whose God is the Lord. Israel is still a blessed nation. It's, they, they've turned to God and they've turned away from him. They've turned to God and they've turned away from him over the last 2,000, 3,000 years, just over and over and over again. But you know what? The nation is still there. And it's still God's nation that he wants to bless. And one day he will bless it for eternity. And God says, 
right here that blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. You know, we, we took God out of our nation in the 50s. We decided out of schools. We decided we didn't need God in schools. I, I, that, that's amazing to me. We just don't need to pray. We don't need to mention nothing about God. We don't need time to look at God's word. We don't need none of that. And so uh, 70 years later, look at what we've got. We've got chain fences around the schools. We've got guard dogs inside the schools. We've got armed people inside the schools. And, we, and still, we cannot protect anything. But you know what? We ain't got God. That's all that matters. We want to teach all this stuff you see now that they want to teach. We want to start teaching kids that they can be a different sex when they're three and four years old if they want to be. We want to teach them all these kind of things. We don't teach them about God. But look where we've come since the 50s. When we, when we worship God in our schools, when we had prayer every day. But you know what? We don't need him. But you look at what we've got because we don't. So it says, The counsel of the Lord stands forever and the plans of his heart to all generation. Blessed is the God, nation whose God is the Lord. And that's what's wrong with the U.S. today. We've taken him out. Then it says, The people he has chosen as his own inheritance. It says, The Lord looks down from heaven and he sees all the sons of men. From the place of his dwelling, he looks on all the inhabitants of He's sitting, he's sitting up there watching us. And he's watching us running around like a bunch of little ants trying to decide what we're going to do and what we're going to do with this earth that we're living on and what we're going to do with each other. We make all kinds of plans. We do all this and God says it's for naught. What we need to do is start trusting him who created everything and made everything. Then in verse 15, it says, He fashions the hearts of individuals and he considers all their works. God knows what we're doing. He knows what we're doing. He knows when we're worshiping Him. He knows when we're serving Him. And He knows when we're doing things to, to honor and glorify Him. He knows about it. Then in verse 16, it says, No king is ever saved by a multitude of an army. Doesn't matter how big the army is. Look at it through all of history. Matter of fact, in Scripture, in the book of Samuel, it talks about one time when King Saul was trying to find David and kill him. One time he went into a cave uh, to relieve himself. And he says, he went into a cave and David and his men was in the back of the cave and Saul didn't even know it. They could have killed him then. Then a few days later, he's out and, and uh, spending the night and they're all laying down in the valley. 3,000, he's got 3,000 men around him per, to protect him. And David and one man walks into the middle of it. They take his water pot and they take his spear and they walk out of the camp. They could have killed him very easily. Matter of fact, the man that was with David said, let me stick the spear through him. He says, he will not move one ounce when I stick this spear through him. He'll be dead. And David says, no, he's God's anointed. God will take care of him. And so they took the spear and the water bottle and walked outside the camp and got up on the side of the mountain. When it got daylight, they hollered at Saul and said, listen, look here. I've got the spear and I've got your water bottle. You weren't even protected. You see, God's the one who protects us. He's the one who takes care of us. So he says a, a king, a, even a king with a mighty king's not even protected by a multitude of men. Then he says a mighty man is not delivered by great strength, no matter how big or no, how, no matter how strong he is. It doesn't matter. Goliath is a good example in the Bible. Nine foot tall, really big Philistine. And one day he challenged all the people from Israel to come and fight him. And if, if ever who won, they would serve that, that country. And nobody would stand up from Israel, would stand up against the Philistine until one little boy came up, a young man who had been out in the pastures with the sheep and had been protecting them. And he saw what was going on. He says, who, who are we to stand here and look at this guy? He is nothing because God is with us. We need to go, and, we need to go against him. And he went out and stood against the man and matter of fact, Goliath was just, he was absolutely perplexed. He says, what are they doing sending a boy out to fight me? Is this all we all have? But David took his sling in the rock and he swung it around and he threw it and he hit him right between the eyes with it and killed him dead. Then he took his sword and he cut his head off. You see, it didn't matter how big he was. God was on David's side. And that's what he's trying to say here. It doesn't matter how, how, how many people you have to fight. It doesn't matter how big the man is that you're fighting against. What matters is who I am. Then verse 17 says, Even a, a fast horse is vain hope for safety. Don't put your trust in anything else. No matter what you want to put your trust in, 
put it in God. Then verse 10 says, Behold, the eye of the Lord is on those who fear him. And he's not talking about the fear where we walk around shaking and scared to death or the fear that we have in the United States now about a lot of things. I remember two years ago when, when the fear of the pandemic hit, I mean, it was just, everybody was just in, in, in total fear going around, scared they was going to get sick and die. Listen, God's the ones who's in control. And so he says, Behold, the eye of the Lord is on those who fear him. We realize that he is the creator and we serve him. So it says, On those whose hope is in his mercy, that's his grace. That's where God wants us to be. God wants us to depend upon Him because He's the only one we can depend upon. You can, we can't depend upon our, uh, uh, another man because we, we fail, falter and we fail each other from time to time. But He says, put your hope in Him and His mercy, that's His grace. In other words, it's the grace that God gives us because we can't do what we need to do. God can give it to us and that's His grace. Then verse 19 says to deliver their soul from death, their soul, the inner being, who we really are, and from death. And he's not talking about just physical death. He's talking about eternal death. And what true the, the true word and meaning of the word death is this, separation from God. And God says that one day the people who have not served him, the people who have not believed in who he is, and what he did in speaking the world into existence and sending his son down to die on the cross, it says that for eternity they're going to be separated from him. And so that's what God's talking about here. He can deliver our soul from death. And he says, can keep them alive in famine. He will take care. He took, he took over two million people and took them out into the wilderness. And for 40 years, God fed them. 40 years, God fed them. And then he took them into the promised land because they finally come to a point where they would serve. He took them into the promised land and he had promised them. But because of their fear and their disbelief and they didn't want to serve God, they wandered for 40 years, but God took care of them every single day. So he says he'll take care of us. So he says in verse 20, Our soul waits on the Lord. He is our help and our shield. For our hearts shall rejoice in him because we have trusted in his holy name. That's what we need to do. We need to stop putting uh, all these other things in our life it, it, more important than what who He is. If you've never accepted Christ as your Savior, I hope today that by listening to this, you will, you will do that. And for the ones of us who are, let's quit depending upon the world. Let's quit depending upon who's going to be president. Let's quit depending upon everything that's going on with all the wealthy people and, and all the, the strings they're pulling to make things go like they want to do. Let's quit wor worrying about that. Let's put, our, let's put everything in him. And that's what he says here in verse 21 and 22. For our hearts shall rejoice in him because we have trusted in his holy name. Our hearts shall rejoice in Christ because we have trusted in his holy name. So he says, let your mercy, O Lord, be upon us. Let your mercy, your grace, your goodness be upon us just as our hope is in you. That's the only place we should place our hope. That's the only place we can put it where it's going to count. Everything else will fail. Everything else will fail, but God won't fail us. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this word today. Lord, I know it's so easy to get wrapped up in the world and in our own lives trying to make things work out for ourselves. But Lord, we don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. We think we do. We think everything's going to be all right. and we've, we've got our handle on things, but Lord, we actually have no idea. Ukraine, back over a year ago, they weren't expecting Russia to, to attack them. They thought everything's going good. And down through history, we see that. People think everything's going good and all of a sudden, destruction. But Lord, you're the one that knows. And Lord, you're the one we can depend upon. And so today, I praise you. And I give you honor and glory for who you are. And Lord, I thank you. And Lord, there's no fear whenever we come to the point where we lay everything in your hands. There's just awe and praise. In Christ's name I pray, amen. Thank you, folks. Y'all have a great day.